Well, I'm going to continue in our new series tonight. Actually, it'll just be a three-part series, uh, Lord willing, that I have entitled The Fall of Adam. Now, last week in our series, I entitled it Wrestling with the Enemy. And tonight, I want to talk about the fall of Adam. Last week, of course, we talked about the fall of Lucifer. But I want to look at some things that are very important to us that we don't often go back and, and look at. Now, if you look at our first frame here, you'll see what looks like a picture of a stained glass window. Uh, there's an angel who's probably supposed to be a cherubim with a flaming sword and escorting or pointing Adam and Eve out of the garden. And that's what I want to talk about tonight. Our passage is from Romans chapter 5, verse 12 through 15. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam. Now I want to stop just for a minute and just highlight something here because we're not going to get a chance to come back to this verse. But I want you to notice how Paul says that death reigned from Adam to Moses even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam. There was something very unique, uh, I could say dreadful, about Adam's sin. And we're going to talk about that tonight. It wasn't just any ordinary transgression for several reasons, but I want to highlight at least a couple of those tonight. Who is a type, that being Adam, of him who was to come, that being Jesus. But the free gift is not like the offense, for if by one man's offense many died, and we know this is true because ever since the fall, death is one per person. And people are born, of course, separated from God. Much more, the grace of God and the gift by the grace of one man, the one man rather, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. So what this verse is saying, in essence, is that the damage that Adam caused uh, to all of his progeny, all of the human race. Of course, he was the federal head of the human race. Jesus Christ, who has come, of course, who is the true Adam, if you will, has reversed for those who are in him the things that Adam has caused. So, as much destruction that Adam caused, Jesus Christ came to, of course, rectify it's a really interesting concept if you think through that. Last week we talked about the great rebellion and the fall of Lucifer, that is Satan, and the beginning of sin. We said that sin uh, predates the human race, it predates the earthly creation. It goes all the way back into the eternal past at some point when uh, Lucifer's heart was lifted up in pride and he desired to set a throne up beside the throne of God or even usurp God's throne and ultimately he fell. So we talked about that last week and we've actually made that available on YouTube in a video again entitled Wrestling with the Enemy. Now this week I want to talk about the fall of Adam and the entrance of sin into the world and the consequences and the realities that we are now wrestling with in the enemy. We're going to just touch upon that. We will get more into it next week. But of course next week we'll talk about God's ultimate solution for reestablishing order in his kingdom. So the devil started all of this. He calls rebellion in heaven and as we're going to see it spread to the earth many thousand years ago. Now in Genesis 2.15 
the scripture tells us that God placed Adam in the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Now, we know that God created Adam from the dust of the earth and that uh, he created this sanctuary, and that's what I've kind of called it, um, a very unique place so that he could have fellowship with Adam. Adam would have a place to live. Adam would have a place to enjoy life, enjoy fellowship with the Lord. And um, it was, in fact, a sanctuary. He was given two responsibilities concerning this sanctuary that we know as the Garden of Eden. He was to dress it and to keep it. Now, the word dress is just, in the Hebrew, is a general word for work or labor. Uh, so in this context, it could mean, you know, he was serving as the gardener or the cultivator. He was the person that went around and, you know, maybe he planted things, maybe he made sure uh, things were uh, going the way they ought to go within the garden. But there was a second aspect of his responsibility, and that was he was to keep it. Now, I've heard it said in studies I've done in the past that he was in a figure to hedge it about with thorns. Um, in other words, he was to guard it. He was to keep it safe. He was to protect it. Um, this word for guard or to keep it rather is the same word that's used of the cherub that had the flaming sword who was guarding the tree of life. Okay? Mm -hmm. So in the same sense that the cherub was guarding the tree of life, Adam was supposed to be guarding the garden. That's a real tongue twister. Guarding the garden and keeping it. So he was responsible for protecting this sanctuary where he and God met in sweet fellowship. So he was to keep out anything that could have been an offense, anything that could have possibly harmed or caused any issues with uh, the garden and particularly his relationship with God. Now, another thing about Adam is that God said concerning him that it wasn't good that he should live alone or dwell alone, but that he would make a helpmeet or a helper that was suitable for him or that complimented him. Men and women have characteristics that complement each other. Uh, and that's what God said. It's not good that man should dwell alone. In other words, he wasn't really complete uh, without his wife. Now the word Adam is a word that means red or ruddy. Uh, it's interesting how when the Bible in the Old Testament uses the word red, it's the word Adam. Uh, so I just thought that's an interesting fact to throw in. Adam was laid to sleep somehow by God, just I guess God's sort of uh, general anesthesia or whatever and took a piece from Adam's side. Some would say, of course, it was his rib. Some would say it was, you know, something over in that general area. And he used that to make woman. Now, the word for woman in the Hebrew is Isha. I hope I'm saying that right. Because she was taken from man, which is the Hebrew word Ish. The first woman, of course, will eventually be named Eve which is a word that's probably pronounced Hava, and it basically means life. Now, when you look at the Septuagint, that word for Eve is translated as Zoe, which people who are familiar with Greek know that Zoe means life. Mm -hmm. So God took this woman, and made this woman rather, from Adam's side to be a helpmeet for him a compliment, a person who could sort of function uh, alongside of him. Now, there's a third person that we need to talk about, I guess a fourth if we're considering we have Adam, we have Eve, of course we have God, but we have this fourth person, the serpent, who is the villain that we talked about last week, Lucifer, 
of course, who led the rebellion in heaven, defiled his sanctuaries in heaven. That's one of the things that we looked at. He took on the form of a serpent, the wisest of all the creatures of the creations that God had placed on the earth with the exception of man. Now, it's hard for us today to understand what the serpent must have been. I wrote in one place in talking about this, sort of like the mercy seat of which we cannot speak particularly, the book of Hebrews says. We don't really know, um, was the serpent a creature that could stand upright on all fours or, or, or what? We don't really know. We just know that based upon the text that the, that the serpent could speak, could communicate, could rationalize, and that Eve was not afraid of this animal. So it didn't have the reputation then that it has today. And as a matter of fact, this event here is what's going to create the reputation that the serpent has or, or the snake has. So Lucifer came into the world with one aim, and that is to break the relationship that Adam had with God. And he was going to do it through sin. Just by way of information, we have a list of Lucifer's cognate names that we find this in two different places in the book of Revelation. And I'm just going to read Revelation 12, verse 9. And the great dragon, that's one of them, was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan. See, he has these uh, different names. But one of them all the way in the book of the Revelation, chapter 12, we have a remembrance made of the old serpent. Um, and of course, the verse continues, which deceives the whole world. There's nothing new, is there? And we're going to see that. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So the serpent took on, or the, the devil took on the form of the serpent, <coughs> spoke with Eve, and began to deceive her. Now, I need to say something about the tree of knowledge of good and evil. In Genesis 2, verse 15 through 17, the scripture says, Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. We already read that. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Genesis 2, verse 15 through 17. Now, surely die in this passage is translated from the doubled Hebrew word muth. And, of course, we know in Hebrew idiom that any time a word is doubled, it's done for emphasis. Okay, so here we have the word muth, muth being used together. I mean, that would sound really weird to us, wouldn't it? If we were reading this in English, it would sound like this. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall die, die. Well, we don't talk like that, do we? But that's how you emphasize something in Hebrew. You don't say it once, you say it twice. So we see this with King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Holy of Holies, uh, Song of Songs, um, on and on and on. We could list many other examples of that. But dying thou shalt die, or this word muth muth together, is ultimate death. In the same sense that the Holy of Holies was the ultimate holy place, dying thou shalt die, or this double use of death is ultimate death. Not just physical death, but it is spiritual death. Now, it's important to understand that unlike in common understanding, death does not mean annihilation in Scripture. Death means separation. So when you die your soul and your spirit separate from your body. This is death, physical death. Spiritual death is when we are separated from God in terms of our relationship. Now, arguably, God is imminent. God is omnipresent. 
David said, I could make my bed in hell, and lo, thou art there. But God is not there in the way he wants to be. And there's a sense in which separation from God is not being separated from him in the ultimate sense, but separated from him in a relationship sense. When we die, our body and soul separate. Spiritual death is separation from God's fellowship. The second death is eternal separation from God's fellowship and his goodness. That's what eternal death is. So it's just important to understand that. So God has warned Adam. He has told him specifically. He's given him, we would say it maybe in military terms, he's giving him a direct command. Do not eat of this tree, because if you will, you are going to suffer ultimate death. So I've often asked the question, what did Adam think was going to happen when he partook of that tree knowing what God had said? See, they had never seen death. They had no concept of what death was, uh, apparently. Maybe, maybe they had some kind of understanding, but uh, nevertheless, God had warned him and he ran roughshod uh, over God's commandment. Now, the scripture tells us again in Genesis 3, verse 1, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has indeed God said that you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? When I've looked at this in the Hebrew, the devil says you will not surely die. And it's interesting because he uses that same construction, die, die. You will not die, die. You won't suffer ultimate death. But I want you to notice that the devil is challenging what God has said. He is lying to Eve. This is the first lie she has ever heard. She's used to hearing God who speaks nothing but truth. She's used to hearing her husband communicate to her the things of God, and it's nothing but truth. But she's facing now Satan in the form of this serpent who is generally known to be wise, and he's lying to her. The serpent was wise, could communicate, and no one had ever challenged God before. The question is, what's going to happen? Now, we know what happened, right? Uh, the scripture said that she looked at the tree um, it was desirous for food. It was one that could make you wise. <coughs> Basically, the devil said that God knows in the day you eat of the tree, you will be as Elohim. That is, be as God. Okay? Now, people translate it, be as gods. It's interesting because they would have had no concept of any other gods but God. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're, we're, we weren't living in the days of Israel or Egypt yeah. where you had, you know, or today where you've got a, how many ever millions of God in India and around the world, this was in a time when the, the human race was very innocent. So when the devil said you shall be as God, uh, he probably was talking about God Almighty, knowing good and evil. She saw the tree, she partook of it, and then of course she went and she gave to her husband as well. But Paul comments on this in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3. He said to the Corinthians, he said, But I fear, lest as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness. Now, when the Bible talks about Eve being deceived, especially in the New Testament, it uses a construction in the Greek language that says that she was thoroughly deceived. It was by his craftiness, and we see that from this verse. We also see in 1 Timothy 2, verse 13 to 14, For Adam was first formed, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Now, I've heard it said before, I've heard Ron say this, and I believe it's true, that when we think about the fall, we can have a certain level of sympathy for Eve because she was deceived. She was deceived. Um, the devil lied to her. She'd never heard lies before. You know, I'm not making excuses, but I'm saying 
we might have a certain amount of sympathy for Eve, but we can never have sympathy for Adam because he heard a direct commandment from God. And when you hear directly from God, there is no excuse whatsoever to go with anything anyone else has said. And that's something to remember. Now I want you to notice what Genesis 3.17 says. Then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife, and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it, cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Now you notice that. Adam hearkened to the voice of his wife. In other words, what she said. Now, I don't know if she tried to talk him into it. I don't know if she just simply rehearsed everything the devil said to her. I don't know if he was able to visibly see how sin had affected her. And maybe, uh, you know, I don't know. It would, it would be speculation because God's not chosen to really reveal a whole lot about it. Having been beguiled, again, that word means thoroughly deceived, she ate of the tree and then communicated to Adam what the serpent said. Adam heeded the voice, he ate of the tree, and at that point, sin entered the human race. Notice what our original text was. By one man, sin entered the world, and death by sin. Did Eve sin? Absolutely she did. Did she commit a horrible sin? Absolutely she did. But there was a difference between Eve's sin and Adam's sin. Adam was the federal head of the human race. God had given him the responsibility of protecting and, and keeping and, and taking care of the Garden of Eden, the very sanctuary that God intended to meet with Adam at, and now he has utterly failed. The serpent has come in when he should have been guarding and keeping things like that out. I don't know what the uh -huh. details could be there, but there certainly would have been some level of responsibility there. Now he's deceived Eve. Now he's taken of the tree himself. Now I want to say some things here. Sin was standing at the door knocking. Okay, You remember that verse in Revelation where Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. You'll also remember what God told Cain whenever he had sinned. He said, Sin is crouching at the door. See, sin always likes to crouch at the door. And it was true for Adam. It was true for Eve. It's true for us today. But God said, But you must master it. And Jesus came and showed us how that, how that works, how to master sin. But I want you to notice something that the scripture tells us that, as it were, Adam opened the door. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Adam opened the door and sin entered into the world. It's like at one moment sin was not in the world, death was not in the world, but at the next moment uh, they walked in. And it was all because he had answered the door. The moment they ate of the tree, their eyes were open and they recognized that they were naked. It is quite possible that prior to this sin event that they were clothed in a visible representation of the glory of God. Now you remember when Moses went up on the mountain. What happened? The very radiance of the glory of God was shining on his face when he came down the mountain. And the people put a veil over his face because they didn't want to uh, see, as it were, the residue of God's glory. So I believe, and you know, I couldn't prove this is true, and you know, a person doesn't have to believe it, but I believe that Adam and Eve were clothed in the very glory of God. Not just in the sense that the presence of God was there, but I believe it was tangible in the sense that it could be seen visibly. But nevertheless, when they sinned, the glory departed and they looked at each other and they saw that they were naked of course their innocence was gone yes and people could argue well you know they were naked before but they just didn't realize it well this could be that's a possible interpretation but when the glory of God left 
when the presence of God, as it were, left, they seen each other for who they were, and their immediate reaction was to cover themselves in fig leaves. Now, there's a passage in the book of Job where he makes a statement where he talks about if he covered his sin as did Adam. Well, you can't cover your sin with fig leaves. As a matter of fact, you can't even cover your sin with uh, animal skins. Now, God did that. Yes, it can cover our nakedness in our physical sense, but the only thing that can ultimately give us the covering that we need is the shed blood of Jesus Christ, which is a very powerful truth. I wish we could get into that. But I want to say something here. Sin has always driven God's glory from His people because the glory is directly related to whether or not God is pleased with us. God's glory, whether it's present or not, is directly related to whether or not He's pleased with us. Now, one of the things that I think has happened in modern times is that people have gone to seed on grace. They've gone to seed on the mercy of God to the point to where they don't think that their lifestyle and how they live has anything to do with how full of the Holy Spirit they are, with whether God is truly with them or not, or any of these things that we're talking about. But a person only needs to make a cursory read of the Old Testament to see that when the people were flagrantly disobedient, even though they were God's people, even though he owned, as it were, the tabernacle or he owned the temple, mm -hmm. no matter if it was God's, it belonged to him, don't bother it, don't mess with his stuff. Uh, didn't Belshazzar find that out the hard way? Yeah. You don't mess with things that belong to God. But even though it belonged to God, even though it was uh, his ark, even though it was his temple, even though it was his, you fill in the blank, all these things associated with where God manifested his presence, when God's presence left, okay, God was gone even though that still belonged to him. And that's a very concerning <clears throat> thought. People think that they can sin and sin and sin and sin, and God's still going to be there. He's, he's always going to be there. And they don't even have a concept that if we really want to know the manifest presence of God, now I don't mean this stuff people feel when they strike the band up in the worship meeting. I'm talking about the manifest presence of God, that when God is truly present and He is there in His glory, in His regal power, when God is really in a person full of the Holy Spirit, when He really dwells in them, not because the person has a scripture verse, not because they can argue theologically, I have the Holy Spirit, I'm full of the Holy Spirit, uh, through logical deductions and proof texts. No, I mean when a person is full of the Holy Spirit like Stephen was full of the Holy Spirit. The reason that that is true <coughs> is because however a person wants to iron it out, the man lived his life pleasing to the Lord. Now, that he didn't earn the presence of God because that's the first thing people want to argue. Oh, he's saying... You earn the presence of God. No, that's not what I'm saying. It's God's grace that uh, God's presence comes. However, it's up to us whether he stays. It's up to us whether he stays. And um, we see that all throughout the Old Testament. Now, to give you an idea of what I mean between the correlation between uh, God's glory and how he is pleased with us look what the scripture said concerning Jesus when he was transfigured in Matthew 17 verse 5 through 7 we hear these words this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased mm -hmm. now think of that there was a glory cloud around Jesus is being transfigured they're standing back going wow so here's Jesus being glorified 
In other words, it's like God took the blinders off and they could see who he really was. But I want you to notice how that's coupled with my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. See, God was well pleased and those things always go together. Peter said it, For he received from God the Father honor and glory. When there came a voice from the excellent, excellent glory, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. 2 Peter 1 verse 17. You see, God's voice was heard where his glory was revealed. Anytime God's glory was present, anytime people were living their life in a way that was well pleasing to God, God was there and God was speaking. Very important. In the garden, they could hear the voice or the sound of God coming, the scripture said in the cool of the day, until sin entered. Adam's sin was the first occasion of God's glory departing. It'll happen again in the days of Eli with his evil sons. What do the scriptures say? And the word of God was precious in those days. There was no open vision. See, there was no voice of God. Why? Well, look at how their sons were living. They were the sons of Baal. Eli refused to correct them. Mm -hmm. Okay? And because of that, they went running headlong into danger with the Ark of the Covenant over their shoulders, presumptuously doing something without a word from God because God wasn't even speaking. That's how bad things were. Mm -hmm. Okay, now he was speaking to Samuel, but he wasn't, and, and I guess you could say he was speaking to them through Samuel, but they weren't listening. They run roughshod over God's word, out into danger, lost the ark, and when the messenger came back to tell it, uh, the wife who was pregnant with this, one of the son's uh, child went into labor and declared the name of the child Ichabod, for the glory is departed. See, you see it again happening in Ezekiel chapter 10. You see God slowly leaving the temple. His glory starts over here, moves a little farther off, because see, God reluctantly leaves. But if sin continues, God will leave. He will deal with folks. He will deal with folks. God is long-suffering. But there will come a point where He will leave. And people need to recognize that. Why should we fool ourselves? Why should we fool ourselves? God is not a God that changes. He doesn't like sin. He's never liked sin. And if we want to see God's presence remain among us, we need to live a life that's well-pleasing to the Lord. Amen. I mean, that's not a popular thing to say. I mean, that's one of the type of statements you could make and lose a hundred Facebook friends. It was in Eden where sin, as it were, walked in and God walked out. Actually, he put Adam and Eve out, but the relationship was over. Sin entered and God exited. I think about Brother Birch who kind of gives his description of what it means to be saved and he simplifies it by saying, saying this, the sin moves out and Jesus moves in. Well, in this case, it was the exact opposite. God moved out and sin moved in. When Adam decided that God can be disobeyed, God decided to leave. When God departed, his voice departed with him. That's important to know. In the place of God's glory, sin entered Adam. And as the federal head of the human race, Adam plunged the whole of mankind into sin. Adam opened the door, and sin entered, and death by sin. The nature of Adam and his progeny became that of the children of wrath. Ephesians chapter 2. Sin entered in, as it were, just like you would enter into a door into the world. It had never been in the world. Adam's disobedience allowed sin not just to enter the world in some mystical sense, but it actually entered into man. This is sin personified. This isn't the deeds of sin. This is sin, the dynamic. This is sin, the disposition. 
From that point on, man has been sinful. By nature, Ephesians 2 tells us, children of wrath, even as others. Mm -hmm. uh, Jesus said, you are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. Um, he that committeth sin is of the devil, John said, 1 John. So sin entered the human race, and man became sinful. The question is, in this condition, what is God going to do? Now, you can see that God would not want the sinful man who is bound by sin living forever in that condition. He did not want that. So what he did was he guarded the way, or sent a cherubim again, a cherub to guard the way of the tree of life so that he could not eat of it and live forever. So God was ultimately going to use death, uh, particularly the death of Christ, but death would be the instrument that God used to ultimately sever uh, sin, if you will, um, from man. And we will talk more about that next week.